was a big thing, you know, that I realized while I was in the deconditioning process was like, I was so disconnected from my body. Well, no wonder I was raised in an environment where my body was evil, my body was bad, it was sinful, it was not to be trusted. And so of course I disconnected from my body. Of course I didn't trust myself, you know? And so when I found human design, that was a process that I feel like also isn't talked about in human design. Like what happens if you enter into human design and you have no idea what your sacral feels like. Yes. Maybe it's not even like, you can't even connect with it. Because you Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke, a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly because deep down only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining me today, Randy. Randy is a 6-2 sacred generator with the cross of cycle. She's also a modern mystic channel and human design, jinkies, astrology expert, and many other things. Welcome, Randy. Hi, Jess. It's so I'm so excited to be here with you today. Oh gosh, I've been I love the approach you take and just how you show up and the things that you share about. But to introduce yourself to the audience, <laughs> in case they haven't heard about you before, who are you? Who is Randy today? Oh my gosh. Well, with someone with an undefined G-Center, <laughs> I love that you said today, because as you know, like it changes, I feel like day to day, year to year. And right now I am a human design and Gene Keys guide and teacher. That's really my main focus right now in my business. And what I really love talking about is how to use the system as a way for both personal and collect collective liberation, um, especially liberation of our mind, which mm -hmm. I feel like as somebody who is a cult survivor, I was born and raised in a cult. Um, I feel like being able to really recognize where we're being conditioned, where we're being homogenized, where we're being pressured to be someone that we're not. I feel like is really so important in our path to living an authentic and fully fulfilled life. I thank you for sharing that because I feel like so many of us, we are all conditioned to a degree, but sometimes there are systems and that are a lot more oppressive than we realize where we give our power away. How was the process for you into coming into like, oh my gosh, how do I reclaim my power back? How do I think for myself after doubting for so long or just not having the spaciousness to do that. Yeah, well, I feel like I'm still in that process. You know, I, I, like I mentioned, I was raised in a cult and I didn't even recognize that I was raised in, in a cult until like two years ago when I started the process of deconstructing the beliefs that I was born and raised with. And the crazy part is like, I didn't even like growing up, you know, I have a defined head in Ajna. So I, I knew from like a young age that I didn't think the same way, that I didn't see the same, see, see, see things the same way as like the community that I was in. And I always felt like I didn't fit in, but I didn't realize the effect that that had on me and that it was still having on me as an adult, even though I was skeptical of it as a young age, I didn't really believe it. So I didn't think it was still with me. I thought I had let that go. I had closed that door. And as I, you know, got deeper into my human design journey and working with the gene keys and starting to look at the not self, look at my shadows, I was curious about, you know, being a cross of cycles, these patterns, these cycles that I was going through. I was like, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Like, why does this, these similar themes keep on showing up for me. Like there has to be, it has to be something else, you know? And, and I think this is where like, you know, I can see my power view coming through and also my personal transferred view, because for a long time, 
I thought there was something wrong with me. That was like my transferred personal view of like seeing things and being like, oh, there's something wrong with me. It's something that I need to fix. Mm -hmm. And even coming into human design and the gene keys, I kind of came with it as like, okay, how can I fix myself, right? How can I, you know, be the best version of me because I was, I felt still inherently broken. And so it was like, how can I use these systems to fix me? Mm -hmm. And what I discovered was like, wait, maybe there's nothing that needs to be fixed. Maybe it's actually these systems, these, you know, things outside of you that you gave your power away to that also are, are influencing you, have an effect on you. And so instead of it being like becoming this like self-shaming and where I thought I was bad, I started to realize that of course I was acting the way I acted because of the way I was raised. And like, of course, you know, things came to like certain patterns and habits developed as a way to protect me, to keep me safe. But as an adult, I was like, I no longer need these tools. Like they're no longer serving me, but I didn't know why it was so hard to break those patterns until I started to recognize the greater systems that had, you know, influenced me as a child and had caused that like close off of like my heart to close off to create those defense systems and relationships. And yeah, so I feel like human design was a catalyst for that. But it also in the, this process, my relationship with human design has completely changed. Like I said, I entered it trying to find a way to like improve who I was to like find why how I could fix myself why I was broken. And I was looking to it for the answers to like, tell me what to do with my life. Like it almost became my authority, you know, instead of like, becoming my own authority, which is really, I think the true purpose of design, you mm -hmm. know, but that took a few years because I approached it in the same dogmatic way that I was raised in a fundamentalist religion because I hadn't deconstructed. I approached it the same way. And once I started deconstructing religion, I deconstructed my approach with human design at the same time. Ooh. No biggie. <laughs> what yeah, so that? I know that's a lot. <laughs> no, oh my gosh. But I feel like, like, thank you so much for sharing this because I feel like so many people, me included, when I found so many different systems and approaches, I wanted it to fix me. And I didn't know I was giving my power away. I did it with yoga. I did it with health, co health coaching, thinking that, you know, the foods I eat, you know, food is medicine, food can heal. And then I became so caught up in the what's right what's wrong this is the reason you're sick this is the reason you're out of balance because of my own choices and then it's like wait there's societal there's economical there's political environmental and also I was raised I mean I chose to be Catholic my parents are atheists but the Catholic way of of being it's a lot guilt driven <laughs> do this and do that so and me having hope um motivation <laughs> I always mix all the words hope motivation and knowing that my transference guilt was like oh, how many times have I made decisions because of guilt have I operated from guilt and see the world through that made decisions made decisions through that so it was really helpful to see where I was giving my power away because even when I, I remember doing yoga going to a yoga instructor that I absolutely love I'm like you fix me you heal me you told me to drink these green juices she's like no 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 and she kept ping pong it back to me I'm like what I'm trying to compliment you she's like yes but I didn't do anything you did the work and I think that was a few maybe like 10 years ago where something started to shift. I'm like, I don't get it, but something's there. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And I, what I see is like that black and white thinking, right? Like, and I entered into human design with that same way. And especially like, you know, there's like this whole like pop HD versus source human design, yes. you know, debate. And I found myself for a long time really on the like, it's source material, that's the only way, you have to totally follow that. And again, like I didn't realize how dogmatic I had become in this black and white thinking and and really just taking everything that human design was teaching me as absolute truth until I started to deconstruct the religion that I was raised in. And I realized how I had been doing that, not just in human design, but in relationships, in so many other areas of my life 
because I hadn't deconstructed. And I think that's, you know, for me, that was such a big thing. Like now I'm able to see more nuance. I'm able to think about things so much more critically and not just take what somebody's saying as absolute truth without first running it through my own authority, experimenting with it and discovering it for myself. Yeah. And I, I, I can understand why it's so tempting to be like, this is the truth. This is the real way, because for a lot of us who find human design or when it finds us, it hits a part parts of us that we haven't seen before. It recognizes totally. those parts of us. So it kind of, it's like, it sees us. So whenever that happens, we're like, then it has the answers. So it can explain why my life didn't work, why things didn't work out. So maybe if I follow this, then, you know, very mental linear thinking and part of the process, probably just to kind of understand what are some and a lot of people, you know, some people say like human design is a cult. And I'm sure in every area, there are cultish practices. Do you mind sharing what have you seen in the industry, even in coaching industry that are kind of cultish practices that we might not catch at first? Yeah, I love this question. And, you know, I want to say first, like, I don't think human design as a system is a cult. I think that any time we're in relationship with others, there is the risk of cult dynamics mm -hmm. because there is power dynamics. Hello, power view. Like, <laughs> you know, I can see the power dynamics in relationship and that can even just be a romantic relationship because there's a lot of similarities with narcissistic behaviors, you know, especially, um, you know, like malicious narcissism, like malignant narcissism. So that can happen in just a relationship with one other person, but it can also happen in groups. It can happen in organizations. And so something that really helped me in my deconstruction process was learning about cult tactics, cult dynamics, how they recruit their members, how they maintain power and control over their members. And one of the leading experts in cults is his name is Stephen Hassan and he's developed what's called the bite model and the influence continuum they're used together and the bite model it describes four different four different tactics so behavior control information control thought control and emotion control that's like the bite right the, each letter stands for one of those tactics and then if you look at that on the influence continuum you can see like is this individual organization group, is it healthy? Is it, you know, and, and list things that like a healthy relationship organization would include like the ability to think for yourself, to be authentic, to, you know, those sort of like things that promote like you being able to maintain your individuality mm -hmm. where cults, it's like you give that up for, the, the group good. for the organization for the greater good right and so it's more about like being able to be controlled and obedience and things like that which is why they use these tactics to do that so you know just talking about like i was talking about pop hd versus source hd to me that's can be potentially a form of information control if we are telling people you can only get your information from this source this is the only source that you can get it from. Don't look at any other sources. They're wrong. And if anybody is criticizing it, then they're wrong. And so it starts to, again, then develop this black and white thinking, which is another hallmark of cults, mm -hmm. having that black and white thinking and creating this us versus them. Yeah. You know, there's this in group and there's this out group, you know, and the in group is the chosen people. And sometimes I think in the HD space, there can be this feeling of superiority because we have this knowledge, we have this information, we can feel superior and be like, okay, we're the in group and anybody who is outside or who questions this is in the out group. So I'll just start there, but I have yeah. so many more I can share. Oh gosh, <laughs> again, thank you for sharing and helping us see the different 
ways that cultish behaviors can come in, and especially in the human design community. I know a lot of listeners are interested in either starting their business or even start talking about human design, but there's so much fear of doing it wrong. And I was definitely one of them because I'm like, if I speak up, I I, I call it the mob. There's the mob of like what real HD, fake HD, whatever it is. And I'm just like, I see people being torn apart and it's been, it's taken a lot of work, but also trust in myself because I didn't want to share human design to be a business. I just shared out of curiosity and that's grown, but it's also like, oh, seeing it there and not being aware of that dynamic and not be like, no, something's wrong with me because maybe that's not their intention. They're so passionate about it, whatever it means for them. Right. But also look like, this is my truth. This is what it makes me feel and recognize that not push it down because I feel like so many of these practices, even in the coaching industry, there's so many techniques and tactics to be like, how can we reframe things? I'm not saying reframe is bad. It's really good and helpful, but sometimes it can be like, Posit, um, toxic positivity where you're always happy all the time so ooh, thank you for bringing this you know the power view into it like yeah and that's a part of thought this? control like you were just talking about that like idea of toxic positivity and that's also emotional control too it's like this idea that like there's good and bad thoughts and we have to keep our thoughts pure we have to you know stay high vibe we can't feel certain emotions even though we have, we know in the human design community, 50% of the population is emotional and should be feeling their emotions. There's still so much shame around that and conditioning around like, yeah, but you know, don't really feel it. Like, and if you do, then there's this shame, like there must be something wrong with you. And so we're always trying to like control our thoughts, control our emotions instead of like, being like, hey, maybe these thoughts, these emotions are here for a reason. Yes. And so, you know, and it, it starts to disconnect us from our body. That was a big thing, you know, that I realized while I was in the deconditioning process was like, I was so disconnected from my body. Well, no wonder I was raised in an environment where my body was evil, my body was bad, it was sinful, it was not to be trusted. And so, of course, I disconnected from my body. Of course, I didn't trust myself, you know? And so when I found human design, that was a process that I feel like also isn't talked about in human design. Like what happens if you enter into human design and you have no idea what your sacral feels like? Yes. Maybe it's not even like, you can't even connect with it because your body's been so traumatized and your body doesn't feel safe that how do you even then start to do the initial steps of strategy and authority when you have so much trauma. Bingo, like you hit the sweet spot because I feel like somebody, so many people come for answers, like tell me how to be more aligned, tell me how to get my dream job. And I feel like part of marketing, part of the benefits that people see and are highlighted often are like, your life is so amazing. I get, I make, I don't know how many figures a month I do this and all that. And people see that. And then they look at themselves and they're like, wait, why are we not there? Maybe we're not doing things right. So it's my fault. So it's because I'm in the not self. And even the idea of the not self, I've had so much trouble you know, holding, I'm like, maybe the not self is not bad. It's not like we're going to amputate that. We're terrible. You're bitter right now. I'm like, yeah, I'm bitter for good reason. <laughs> like, how can we even hold on to those parts and really kind of like reclaim it? Like extra TLC, like maybe some tenderness to it, some love. We don't need to swing from one side to the other. And for you, as you, you know, in your deconditioning process, as you start viewing it from this other perspective, how has I guess your work change? How have you changed through the process? Yeah, I love this question. And I'll say that the Gene Keys had a big part of me shifting my relationship with the not self, with my shadows. But that also took time, you know, because when I started learning about the Gene Keys, I thought that the shadows were something I needed to get rid of. I mean, I remember seeing my life's work, you know, my conscious son in gate 54 with the shadow of greed and being like, that has to be the worst shadow. No. I can't let anybody know that this is what, like, and I also have it twice in my Gene Keys profile. It's also my like, IQ. I'm so greedy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Which is not yeah, it's also my conscious <laughs> Venus. So I'm like, uh, like this is the worst chart ever. Yeah. I need to like, hide this away. Like we can't let anybody know we're greedy. And 
that was like, honestly, like a, a long part of my journey was this like suppression of greed and denying that that was a part of me because I didn't want to be seen that way. I was uh, so afraid of that shadow. And recently I've really like transformed my relationship with it to see the usefulness of greed. Like, because I feel like all of these shadows, again, have developed for an evolutionary purpose, initially to help us just survive, right? You know, 54, it's like, it's part of the tribe and it's like, okay, how do we, how do we help the community survive? We need to make sure we have these resources. And so of course it was greedy. Like it makes sense, you know, evolutionary, but like now we've evolved where we don't have to be in that state of greed. You know, we can aspire to something greater beyond just like material, but it serves a purpose and it serves a purpose to make sure that both my needs and the needs of my community are taken care of. But I can't take care of my community if I'm not taking care of myself. Yeah. And so I've really realized how there is like greed is divine in itself. Like it's my divine shadow. And through that, I find my aspiration. I find the gift and it comes from me really learning to embrace it rather than reject it, rather than suppress it, push it down or react to it. You know, mm -hmm. like we can go from the repressive or the reactive shadow and we're often swinging from both extremes, but like the gift really emerges in that middle path. You know, learning from, we have like the repressive nature of 54 is unambitious. The reactive nature is greedy. And I've swung from unambitious to greedy and back and forth, but like, I have to learn from both of those because if I just repress it, I found myself being unambitious, like not taking care of my own needs, you know, really kind of being a martyr for like a greater cause. Mm -hmm. And I've recognized that like, I, I can't swing to the other side and be greedy and just, you know, do it all for myself but I need to find that middle path. And that's where my aspiration comes from. So it's taken a lot of time of, I mean, I think that's really the greatest lesson is like, this all takes time because I've been working with these systems for the past six years, you know, next year will be like my seventh year, this deacon. And I'm like, again, I would have thought, oh, I thought I would have been like, you know, when we hear these stories, we think, oh yeah, then I'll be then I'll be healed. Then I'll yes. be, you know, I'll have reached this destination. And I'm just realizing, especially as a cross of cycles, <laughs> that like, I'm going to just keep on going through it. But it's, it's a spiraling, you know, every time I face another one of these patterns again, yeah. I like to recognize how I'm facing it as a different version of myself. Mm -hmm. Because like, even though I'm going through the pattern again, I am different. Because if I can in, in you know, really bring awareness to these experiences, then I will enter in to the next cycle with a greater level of awareness. And so it's, it's just like a deepening, a spiraling that I think is just an ongoing process. And it's falling in love with the process, I think is the secret. Yeah, especially because you do have the 4253, the channel ma maturation, this formatting channel. So cycles, beginnings, ending, that's like such a big theme of you're being, you're always beginning, you're always ending something. And it can, I can imagine it feeling so exhausting if you, you haven't been able to nourish yourself, if your sacral has been depleted, if you are, you know, in complete alignment, you know, the fact that you have, you do have the energy to do for it, to go for it. But if you're exhausted, then it, it can lead to even more burnout. Yeah. And I've seen patterns of how my defined heart can like come in and just like push through and be like, nope, we're gonna keep going. Even though I'm depleted, I don't have the energy. My sacral is saying no. My spleen is like, this is not healthy for us. Like my defined heart can just be like, we're we just gonna this. keep pushing through, you know? And like, that's been a really big area of deconditioning for me is like seeing where I just try to force things. Even when my sacral is like, we've had enough. Oh. I can relate with the defined heart. Like I have the defined heart and the spleen and that little mighty motor can push me to like extremes. I can pull on nighters if it's something I love doing, but it's also like 
not the most sustainable. It's also like, okay, thank you, little mighty heart. Please <laughs> release me and knowing what, what other areas I amplify. And it's also so interesting because you, like you're 54, you have it in so many placements. You also have the full stream of instinct. So that's almost the energy of like, okay, what do we need to grow? Like, what is sustainable? How can we endure it? And also like, wait, but what kind of change are we making so that the past doesn't repeat itself? Who do we work with? Okay, share with the community. So that's such a big drive of who you are and what you do, I can imagine. Yeah, and really for me, it's been about like being able to sniff out the right communities and the right people because, you know, being a 6'2", being transpersonal, like, my community and, it, and having an undefined G center, it's so important for me to be surrounded by the right people. And that was something that like I questioned for a long time because I I initially will just have these like instincts about people mm -hmm. and like people like even online, I'll just like get a bad taste in my mouth, taste cognition. And I'm like, I don't know, something about this is off. But then I'll see like all these people are like, this person is the thing. Oh my gosh, they're so popular. And then I start to question myself oh, and I start to question my instincts. And I've had several times where I've been proven right. You know, mm -hmm. after I've doubted myself, like things will come out eventually. And I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> I should have just trusted myself. And so I think sometimes too, like we have to make the mistake to actually like learn to trust ourselves like do it the opposite way and then be like oh okay yeah okay now I know you know and so having a number of those experiences now I've really learned to like trust that initial instinct I have about people but also remain open to like hey that can change in the yeah. future like as more information comes in but an I'm usually pretty right about just like initially knowing being able to sniff out especially if I'm in aura with somebody like who are my allies who are you know the people that I'm here to like be in communion with yeah and you're also a wide split with a completely open throat tell me more about it because I am so fascinated by open throats my husband's an open throat and I feel like for the most part they are you know pretty chill and quiet but once the energies get moving you know, something they tap into something they're passionate about. And it's just the, the beauty, the wisdom just comes out. <laughs> yeah, well, I can say now that I'm definitely more quiet, but I was not that way when I was younger, because I think I was just trying, you know, that not self of the undefined open throat, like doing things to get attention, to try to be seen and heard. And like my undefined G center, I could just be whoever you needed me to be. And like, you know, I can be people's biggest cheerleader. I can like really amplify that energy, but then never really feeling seen, never really feeling recognized. Like when I was trying to like force that on other people, you know? So it's really been about like learning to wait for that to be invited, to wait for the right energy while also knowing that like, because I have that wide split, it is so important for me. You know, it's just another reason why all the other reasons in my design, why I need to be in communion with other people. You know, I also have Valley's environment. And so being connected, having my ear on the ground, feeling like I have that flow going on, you know, in communion with others is just so important for me. Um, but it's also been a big challenge, like to find the right spaces, to find the right people, especially as I go through this process of deconditioning. It's been about, you know, a lot of times letting go of the relationships that I've realized weren't serving me, um, you know, and then really investing in the ones that I feel like I am seen, I am recognized yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Definitely. And my mind is going, it's like, you're also on the roof right now. So I can imagine a lot of those dynamics changing, like right after your Saturn return or during, like, have you noticed that? I think we talked a little bit, even on DMs about like the six energy and how it feels. And yeah, how does your six feel like for you since it's conscious? 
Yeah, I have so many conundrums in my chart, especially with this six line, because below my six line, I have a third color, which is desire motivation, and I have a leader trajectory. So like, I'm designed to get involved, to take action, to create change. And yet here I am up on the roof. And a lot of times I don't want to get involved. I'm like, I'm good. And I can see how that can pull me into my transferred innocence motivation of like, I'm just going to do me. I'm not going to get involved. Like, let me just sit up here on the roof and hermit, you know, being a six, two, I feel like this roof time is very comfortable for my second line. We're like, we're yeah. good. We're just going to like isolate ourselves, be alone. And yet there's all these other things in my design. That's like, go out. but you need to get yeah. out there. You need to be with the right people, but it's not that I need to get involved in everything. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's kind of what I'm learning in this roof process is like, what is the, what is my thing that I'm creating change around? Cause like desire is about getting locked into something, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, what is my thing? Like right now it feels like human design. Like I'm locked into it, but maybe that's not going to be it forever. I don't know. You know, also embracing that as an undefined G center because I can cling on to identities even when they're not serving me. Oh, so I really see. had to be like, okay, like part of that deconstruction process for me in human design was being like, could you just walk away from all of this tomorrow? And like initially it was like, no way because it was like everything to me. But yeah. now I'm like, yeah, I could. I could just mm -hmm. walk away. And like that to me feels like a healthy relationship where like I can be in it, but I can also know that like, it's not everything. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like part of it is learning what, what I'm here to be a role model of, mm -hmm. what I'm here to like create change around. And I think that's part of this healing process up on the roof is like, I'm learning that through the integration of this healing from the first life stage. You know, I'm learning more about myself, more about the change that I want to create as I heal up on the roof while still being able to like, because I feel like healing can't really help happen just in isolation, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like that's why transpersonal karma, like we're healing karma and that happens in relationship with people, you know, yeah. like I, I did a lot of work on myself and then I would go around my parents <gasps> and I would be back to like my teenager self. And I'm like, what is this? Like, why <laughs> am I like this? You know? And I think that's really, it is like, you can do all the work by yourself, but like, it only really matters if you can integrate that when you're in relationship with other people. Oh, yes. That's such a big component, I think, that I'm starting to notice. Like, I've done so much inner healing and all those things, and people around me, they might not. It's not their bread and butter. They're not as fascinated. I'm just like, tell me about your life. Tell me about your feelings. Let's go there. Let's go deep. That's what I love doing. And I know a lot of people don't, not because they're not necessarily ready. It might be true, but it's also like, it's not their focus. And that's totally fine. And learning about like, okay, who are the people who can see me as a four six that's on the roof, single definition. I'm so self-absorbed. I can just be in my bubble. I can just be like, don't talk to me. I'm happy here. But also understanding that it's not healthy for me. I am a fourth line. I do need to see people. I do need to move that energy as well. And it's challenging because sometimes I feel like we can have so much awareness that we get stuck in our heads. Yeah, totally. I mean, as a defined head in Ajna, <laughs> like <laughs> it's so funny because people will be like, like I say this every time my emotional center is defined through the transits. I'm like, how do emotional authorities do it? And then when people have their head in Ajna defined by the transits, they're like, how do they do it? <laughs> It's, and it's, it's like, so much. Yeah, I don't know. It's just so funny. Like, I just, I'm like used to constantly having these thoughts and pondering things and going over and over and over it. But yeah, I can see how for somebody who that's not a part of their energy, it just feels like it's probably just taking a lot of your energy to try to like be it's in cute. a space where you're, you know, you're not designed to be in a way. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Sometimes with the transits, 
especially with mental definition, I'm like, oh gosh, it's so much more harder to sleep. And I used to think before human design, something's wrong with me. Why do I have insomnia? But now with the trends, it's in the moons and all this. I'm like, okay, I'm just amplifying a lot of this. So instead of my my orientation, instead of like guilt, I'm doing something wrong. It's like, okay, how can you support yourself? So I put on a show so to help me sleep. I read a book or I listen to music instead of thinking like, oh, I I used to think it's bad that I could only sleep with a show, like all those guilt stories that we were conditioned. And it's like, no, that's just what my body needs. So it's so refreshing to hear. And I'm so glad you brought up the mental definition because I know you have an offering around that, but also like there is so much in, in coaching spirituality where the mind is almost villainized. Like it's such a beautiful, important tool in our decision-making process, even though it might not be the starting part, but we do bounce ideas and think about it. How has that process been for you to kind of really embrace your mental definition and how it supports your process? Yeah. Well, one thing that I love discovering was that my rising sign is in gate 63 and that like gate of doubt and being yeah. like, man, I've, I've been... <laughs> I've been like that from a young age. Like I said, being raised in a cult, I was, I was doubtful. I was questioning things and, you know, I've, I've always been like that. And so, you know, also having the 6124 channel that defines my head and Ajna, you know, I've always been interested in solving the mysteries and like making sense of it and rationalizing it and being into the occult. You know, I also like my 54.6 is looking to 61.1, which is occult knowledge. So it's like a lot of like what I'm aspiring to is like looking towards this occult knowledge. And so, yeah, like when I entered into human design and finding out that the mind wasn't the authority, that was a, a relief because for a long, I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, like I've been making these mental decisions my whole life. I've been stuck in my head my whole life. But like I said, I didn't have any tools yet. Like it was like, okay, we'll start following your sacral authority. But I had so much trauma around my body, so much shame around my body that I didn't even know what that felt like, how to connect with it. And so that led to me then feeling a lot of shame around this energy that I had felt connected with my whole life, mm -hmm. you know, in my head, in my Ajna. It was like, that's the only energy I'm aware of. Right. <laughs> Even though like, because all four of my channels are half conscious, half unconscious. So I'm a conscious and unconscious reflector. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like my energy just works differently than how it was described and especially like sacral authority oh it's in the moment you get a hell yes like you're just gonna you know like no in that moment I'm like I must be broken because I don't experience that at all you know and so for a long time there was like just a lot of shame around my design and like it didn't seem to work like other people's and so I feel like the process again of this deconstruction has also helped me to like honor the definition, my, my mental definition to see its value, but also to recognize again, that it's not the decision maker in my life, but it can provide valuable insights. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really great at spotting patterns. It's really great at like, you know, being able to see logically and pick up on things that can help me in my decision-making process. It's not the final authority but it can provide valuable information. And I think that's also been something that I've changed along the course of my experiment is like, I no longer just look at my sacral as like the only one that can tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I like to look at the voices of all of my definition and even my undefined centers, you know, and being like, okay, cool. Like you can give insight, like, but again, I see it like a board meeting. Everybody has a voice. Everybody's bringing in information. And so a lot of my process, even though I'm a sacral authority, has been about giving myself time in making decisions. You know, yes. I'm not emotional. I'm technically not a reflector, even though I have these reflector sides. I feel like I need more time to really connect with what my sacral is feeling tune into the voices of my other definition. And ultimately what's really helped me is learning about my taste cognition 
and learning to trust that to help me in making decisions. Because like I've said, I've, there's been so many situations where I just immediately get a bad taste in my mouth, mm -hmm. like, or my mouth goes dry. I'm like, like, uh, you know, or I start, my mouth starts watering or I start to see what I'm saying I'm craving. And like letting that help guide me has been really, really helpful because it's something that's with me all the time that as I've started the process of deconditioning has become stronger and stronger and something that I can really tune in with that I help that I think helps guide my decisions as well. And does that, does having that point of focus also help you sensitize to your sacral, how your sacral speaks to you? Because you said how at the beginning you didn't know how is your relationship to your sacral right now or I don't know yeah how's your relationship how does it how do you guys chat <laughs> yeah well you know I think because I have that format channel that defines my sacral the 54 I'm sorry the 42 uh 53 you know that's been something else that I've been contemplating about the sacral because it's like the sacral isn't an awareness center and like, and let, and if you have one of those format channels, it's pressured energy going directly to another motor with no sense of awareness. And that's the only, you know, those three channels are the only three places where pressurized energy doesn't get filtered through awareness. You know, like it should be filtered through awareness and yet it's not. And so, so again, I think that's why I need time to be like, is this just pressure to act? Or, you know, cause it's like starting things, ending things that like cycle of maturation, uh, you know, something that I started to realize recently in my business was like, I was just starting things over and over and over again out of fear, mm -hmm. you know, from that place of fear, you know, which is 53, the shadow is immaturity. And it's like doing things over and over and over again, expecting a different result. And you're doing it over and over again, coming from that same place, coming from that place of fear, coming from that place of lack and scarcity. And that's what I was doing. Like I was just starting things from this pressure, like, okay, we got to do something. We got to like, and so I would start something out of fear because I just was feeling that pressure. Mm -hmm. And so- even though, again, I have sacral authority, my relationship with my sacral has really been about like learning to discern like where I truly feel like, because even though I might get a yes for something, mm -hmm. it might be a yes for a certain aspect or a certain like, I feel like because it doesn't have that awareness, it takes time for me to be like, okay, it's a yes for this. It's a no for this, yeah. you know, because- big decisions. There's so many parts of it that like, you might be a yes for a certain part, but a no for a different part. Like right. recently I had gotten a part-time job and I was a sacral yes for the job. But once I started, it was a no. And so I was like, why, why did I get a yes? Right. And I was like, I think the yes was for a different, like it wasn't for doing the job itself. It was for the, the financial stability. It was for getting health and like, it was a yes for other aspects that I wanted, but it wasn't, it wasn't a yes for actually doing the physical job. And once I started to do it, I started to see that that energy just wasn't there for it. Right. Right. So it's oh. been a lot about like seeing where I just naturally, because when it is coming from my sacral and not just my root pressure, it will flow. I'll just feel like I can just keep going. Like the energy is there. It's flowing. I'm not facing that resistance. Like when it's not really coming from my sacral, my defined heart can try to push me to do it, but it just doesn't have that same feeling, right. if that makes sense. Oh, totally, totally. And I can imagine having that root pressure, which is like the release of energy and your sacral is really also because it doesn't connect to your throat in a way like you can't really feel it. I don't know if you have loud or strong uh -huh, uh -huh moments because I've talked to other people with undefined throats with a sacral authority. They're like, I don't feel it as obvious. I do hear their grunts sometimes, but it's not like what people say. Like, it's almost like a magic ball. It's going to tell you yes, if you want spaghetti, it's going to tell you no, if you want pasta, like whatever it is, but like the little nuance of like, wait, this scenario is saying yes for this but now it's something else and also like adapting because 
it's such a human part to learn from things. Like we're not going to always make the best decisions, whatever that means, right? We're here to learn and things are not going to be perfect all the time for us to learn. We won't learn in that context. Yeah. I think we have to release shame or guilt around like, or fear around making a wrong decision oh, yeah. because it's like, I don't really think there's a such thing as a wrong decision. And I think even in human design, it can be like strategy and authority, strategy and authority. And then there becomes this fear of like, what if I, was that my authority? Like, I remember for so long, I was like questioning, was that my sacral? Like, again, taking that job being like, was that really a sacral? Yes. Because now it feels like a sacral. No, maybe I didn't really get a sacral. Yes. Like, and then starting to go back and forth and question myself instead of being like, maybe it was, and now it's a no and yeah. that's okay. And maybe you wouldn't have found this out until you actually went and did it and experienced it. And yeah. I think there's, again, a lot of like shame with being a six line and mm -hmm. still having a lot of third line experiences. And like, I, I don't know, man, like that's like part of life. Like life is a third line. Like we're in this third line experience. Like how, I don't know. I feel like I can't escape the third line experience. Oh, yes. I don't have the same resilience to it as I, you know, maybe I did my first stage of life. I'm definitely more discerning about experiences I go into but I'm still learning from trial and error. I don't get it perfect every time, you know? Oh yeah. And I think even something I've learned with my undefined G, I will commit to things with that defined heart. I will get into things. I feel it's such a splenic yes. And then I get into it after a few weeks and I'm like, oh gosh, it's not something I really want. It's not what I expected. But the undefined G doesn't care the outcome. It just wants to try whatever it was pulled to do. And I guess releasing the pressure to have to look a certain way, do the things that are expected for quote unquote stability in the eyes of the others. But I think right now we are feeling it that the structures are changing, organizations are crumbling, like the way we used to make money is not the same as how we're making money now. And feeling that and being a part of change, there's so much insecurity that's coming up, which is fine. But also like, how do we root into ourselves in the midst of all that? And I know you've also going through a lot of different transitions in your business, in your life where, where you're moving, I think you're moving soon as well. Tell me a little bit about these big transitions. Yeah, I'm in the midst of several transitions right now. And I think a big thing is like, I can feel pressure because I'm in like a void period right now. I can feel pressure, especially from my parents to like figure my life out because oh, yes. I'm 38 years old. I'm right now, I'm like kind of going through this period of like figuring out what I want to do with my business, to be totally honest with you. It's like, what what was working before isn't working anymore. There's like, you know, I feel like I'm also realizing where I was in burnout for a lot of my business and like just, again, doing things from that pressure, not really feeling a sacral response. And so it's like, how do you actually build a business and be able to honor these things when like, you have to live in this 3D world and pay your bills. And what if you don't have a sacral response to do anything and you got to pay your bills, you know? And so that's been something like recently I'm like, okay, how do I create a life? How do I, you know, create the foundation so that I can run my business in alignment with my design and not constantly feel like I have to just be doing things just to make money. Yeah. You know, so um, one of those transitions is I'm moving to Arizona. I'm going to be moving because um, right now I live in Hawaii. And so cost of living here is is very expensive. And with how things are going in my business, like the past couple of years, um, I would say probably the height of my business was 2021. 2022 was when I started deconstructing and things started to like slowly go downhill. Yeah. And then last year was like this big void space where I was just in the middle of this deconstruction. And now I'm coming out on the other side and like really figuring out how to put the pieces together. And so, you know, going back and like living with my parents for a period of time is going to be this space to really help me figure out what this next stage is going to be about, how to put these pieces together after I've deconstructed 
like my whole life, you know? And, and I think that's the thing too, like a lot of people don't talk about like, and I even expected in the beginning, like, well, if you're living in alignment, everything's just going to look great. Everything's going to be fine. Like you're going to be super prosperous. And like, truly, I feel like I am my most authentic self right now. And my whole life has been turned upside down. And so I'm like, oh, (laughs) that's interesting. Like I thought, I thought, I thought I would, I wouldn't have any of these challenges anymore. That wasn't in the fine print. (laughs) Yeah. Like what? Like that doesn't seem to be how I'm seeing it on Instagram. Like what? All these other people are making all this money. Like, and that's my transferred personal view. I'll be like, well, there must be something wrong with me. Like I'm not good enough. Da, 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 da. And so, yeah, I think a big part of this that I'm going through is grief. Mm. <laughs> and I might even cry. Oh. <laughs> it's like, I think that's a big thing is like right now, I think we all have to like learn how to make space for grief because the reality is that the world is changing the old is crumbling and, and and it has to die. It has to die. But as you know, Western cultures, we really struggle with making space for grief. We're talking about death. And I feel like that's why right now it is a struggle is because there's so many people who are trying to avoid the fact that the old is dead. It is already dead. But we're keeping it alive because we're clinging to it. And so if we can learn to grieve, to hold space for this death so that we can actually learn the lessons from this experience so that we can birth something new that isn't going to look like the old, but will emerge from the lessons of the old. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the key. And so I feel like for myself personally, I'm experiencing this personally, but I feel like it's also a a greater story collectively, you know, because I'm grieving old versions of myself that like wanted to believe that it was just so easy that I could just like, you know, get these codes and like, you know, everything would be solved. And I'm realizing that like a bigger part of my story is that like, I'm healing some deeper ancestral wounds and it's not going to look the same and it is going to be challenging But that's also a beautiful process as well. And like, if I can see grief as a beautiful process, if I can like embrace that, I feel like that will also allow me to like flow through this period with a lot more ease, grace, and compassion Mm -hmm. than like what it has felt like for a while has just been, you know, shaming myself, like feeling like, why don't I just get to the other side? Like, I'm so done with this period. Like, let's just move on. And yet I feel like I haven't allowed myself to really grieve, to really, you know, fully just let go so that something new can emerge. Thank you for sharing that. I feel it. I feel it in my bones. And I don't know if it's, you know, the shadow, the sleeping phoenix coming and we're really making space for that. But I, I see it. I see it so much in business and how things used to work, how we talked about it, how we coaches used to make money, get this, get this, and you'll survive and you have financial abundance and that version of success that was sold to us. And I'm, I find myself kind of in the, in the midst of like, this is not sustainable. This is not sustainable. Even the prices that I've seen, and I know you've also been like transforming your business. You're like, I want it to be reflective of where I'm at and support more people with it. And at the same time, it's like, we need to pay our bills. Like, we don't know what the middle is. We don't know how to do that. But at the same time, you're honoring your truth. And it's so fucking scary because things need to crumble. It's not, we can point out the problem, but we are not going to see the solution until we just move through it, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a challenge because, you know, you hear this phrase, like you can't heal where you've been wounded, where, where you've been traumatized. And I'm like, but what if I've been traumatized by capitalism? Mm. Yes. Talk more about it, please. You know, like, I mean, it's like how, how we all have exactly. And and to me, I feel like capitalism is an agent of white supremacy. 
Mm. It upholds white supremacy, you know, and and I know a lot of people, I feel like capitalism is one of those things that you can't really question because then you're a communist, you're this, you're mm. that. And, you know, I just see that like we have to envision a world beyond this like capitalistic structure where, you know, we're putting profit over people where that's like the focus and it's always about growing and scaling and bigger and faster and more production. And I feel like to be totally honest with you, my deconstruction process, my deconditioning, embodying my design has led me to this point because if we are really, you know, honoring the differentiation of all beings, how can we be promoting growth and scale and productivity mm -hmm. and all of these things that like really don't align with our true nature? Even if you're a sacral generator or a manifesting generator, like we are not just built to just be machines, yes. you know, like we... <laughs> We're driven by our pleasure, by our joy. We need also periods of rest, of play. And the way that our societies have been structured have, you know, especially in this modern era, don't support that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I really want to envision something that does support our differentiation. And I think that is where the Sleeping Phoenix is going. You know, I think that... And but the sleeping phoenix, I mean, it's asleep right now. Oh yeah, it's and burning. Like, it's burning. You know, before it's coming and yeah, up. exactly. We have to like, you know, the phoenix emerges out of the ashes. I think people forget that part. It's like it literally, it has to all burn down. We have to let it all go for it to then emerge. And that process, I feel like, is there is no no certainty. Yeah, like we don't really know. And I feel like that is the hardest part especially for like the older generations. Like I see it in my parents where it's like, no, this is how it's always been. This is how it's always going to be. Like they really have a hard time with like letting go and envisioning something, else, even if we can't see it. And I, I feel that it's less for me, but I still feel that where it's like, I can see that these things need to crumble, that they need to go, but I don't have all the answers. I don't necessarily know what the vision is. But I don't think one single person will. Right, right. It's such a collective energy. And I think even like our parents' generations and the ones before them, they relied so much on structures, on that certainty. You do A, you, you go to school, you get a degree so you can get a job forever and get paid. And that was, you know, in their hierarchy of needs. And that makes sense with the, with the cross of planning, right? It's like, yeah. okay, you make a bargain, you <laughs> da, 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 you have like, Hey, it makes sense. But yeah, like with this, all this shifting, I, I see it happening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel it. And especially like with business, I, I noticed the exhaustion of having to produce something all the time, like content creator machines and also seeing how unsustainable it is. Like it makes no sense. If we look at nature, nature is not always hard. We're not always harvesting fruits. There is a period of death of winter of yeah. silence and I don't think we have enough of that and I love that you brought that up and also like sometimes the growing pains of being in alignment because alignment does not mean that you just have no care in the world it means our way of being is more authentic to us it means that we're closer to we're standing for our beliefs and that might make us banned from Instagram that might be sh not sharing certain stories, not speaking about certain things. Right. And it's just like, wow, how do we really individualize, differentiate, stand our ground and also be open to this uncertainty of basically all the systems being burnt down and be like, we're starting something new. And that's, that's scary. And I love, love that you brought that up because we need to really hold space for that in ourselves because so many of us like I could feel it and like we're feeling it we're feeling the grief but we don't know where it's coming from or like how do we hold that usually when there's discomfort we want more solutions it's like oh do this do this do this <laughs> but it's actually like maybe it's just holding it giving yeah. ourselves a space to be a couple of months whatever it is you know going to live with your parents and like just let me be so I can yeah. come back yeah, I think that's it is like, I don't know if we're going to find the solutions if we're not allowing ourselves to really grieve the end of like 
the world as we know it, not just, you know, I know that sounds almost like, <laughs> like, whoa, but like, seriously, I feel like the world as we know it is crumbling and like people who are just, you know, a lot of people think that we can just fix it with like a few tweaks and a few, like, you know, I thought that way for a long time, like, oh, if we just, you know, get more money in the hands of women and more hands and, you know, more money, like in the hands of minorities, like that'll be the solution. But like, it's seeing that like the systems, the structures themselves are rotten from the core, like from the core, because they were built from homogenization. Like a lot of what I see that, you know, where I believe the root of what is going wrong in the world is that we've been raised to be homogenized. And so people are creating things from their transferred view, from their transferred motivation, which comes out distorted. It comes out, you know, raw called our transference dumb because it's <laughs> not cognitively driven. So we have dumb hope, we have dumb fear, we have dumb guilt, we have dumb innocence, dumb desire, dumb need you know, because it's not coming from our true cognitive potential because we are homogenized. And so the the way that we can access this cognitive potential is by honoring our differentiation. And I think that's our purpose in life. I think our only purpose in life, I don't think it has anything to, what, to do with what we do, what we accomplish, what we produce in life. Our purpose is to differentiate to be our authentic self, to live as our authentic self, because in that, that's where we can actually create real value. Mm. And real change, sustainable change. Because yes, like real change. Not Band-Aid approaches that I get it totally. right now. The foundations are crumbling, so Band-Aids are trying to support it. But it's also like, okay, there are changes that might help, but there is bigger changes that need to happen. Uncomfortable changes, uncomfortable conversations that we need to face and regulate in the meantime. Yeah, I feel like pe what people need in this period is like tools to deal with the grief, to deal, to learn, to embrace the uncertainty. Like we don't need these things to just put band-aids on the old because all that's doing is perpetuating, <laughs> perpetuating it. And like, you know, the quicker we can like embrace this, the quicker we can move, I think, move through this phase and get to the new, you oh. know, but it's like the more we just try to like, but hospice <laughs> you know it's like we're just trying to like hospice this dying thing instead of like okay like or you know maybe we should hospice it so it can die with grace and dignity and allow something new to emerge you know I love that I love that like so often we kick and scream in in times of change and it's a normal reaction human reaction but also knowing like yeah okay how much energy have you exerted in trying to preserve something that is no longer wanting to be here in a way like it, mm -hmm. something new needs to come and if we don't need to know the certainty we don't need to know the how but it's like can we ground into ourselves? can we lean on the people have these conversations I think even just talking about it can trigger something's happening things are happening I think just, that's the biggest yeah. thing is we need to have more of these conversations because like I said I don't think one person is going to have the answers I think the answer is going to come from us collectively being in our authentic self, seeing through our unique view and perspective, and then being motivated through our unique motivation so that we can really create value in the world in communion with others, in our conversation with others, you know, using our outer authority to commune with others. Like, I think that's really what's going to allow these solutions to emerge. Definitely, definitely. I feel like so fired up and inspired I'm like thank you for it it's, <laughs> it's so needed in the world oh my gosh what are are you going to take some time off what are some plans that you have ahead for the rest of the year yeah so right now we're speaking in March and I'm going to be moving in May so the next couple of months what I've kind of done is I've just like released any pressure right now to make money in my business because I feel like I just want to give myself this space with like the last couple of months that I'm in Hawaii. I don't want to like just be like running off of this pressure, like got to make this thing work. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to like pull back kind of like I I've been working a part-time job for a while. 
put more hours into that so that that can kind of sustain me while I'm going through this transition. But ultimately that's why I'm moving is that so that I can allow my business then to emerge from a place of like true desire rather than like this like pressure to just make money and, you know, need to like support myself, um, which I totally like, I, 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 to I'm not shaming anybody who's doing that because trust me, <laughs> we need to I survive. Get it. Like yeah. we need to survive. I totally get it. Like, and I think that's the challenge is, you know, that that's kind of like where I think the real work is coming in is we can see these things, we can know it, but like, how do we actually embody it, put it into practice while still existing with these old systems? And I don't have the answer. I don't have a solution, but I feel like that's part of my process is like, okay, I'm not willing to compromise on my values on what I want to stand for. Well, I also want to take care of myself, make sure I'm provided for. So how do I like merge those two? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm still like, that's a big kind of what I'm doing over the next few months is just like figuring that all out. Um, so I'll be moving to Arizona in May and I'm really excited to be back just like closer to people. Cause I feel like too, part of being in Hawaii, I, fe I felt very isolated for a while so I'm really excited to just be like closer to people, closer to um, my brother and his three kids, which is just like really cool to witness them. They're like totally different designs, which is like he has a, an emotional manifester, uh, ego uh, projector and a oh. sacral generator. Oh, yeah. that is fascinating. I was like, I right? want to watch the emotion manifester with the ego projector. That oh my gosh, they are like <laughs> that's yeah. so fascinating. And it's so I, funny. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, like thank you for sharing that because it takes courage, so much courage to live by your values and also giving yourself that grace to be. And I found that whenever I I, there's been so many times in my business where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't make money. What I do, and the more I try, the less came in. The more totally. that I was like, you know what, fuck that. I'm gonna just enjoy myself, take care of my body, okay, and you know, also nourish my nervous system. And it's like, wait, something's coming. Why are the opportunities coming when I'm not trying? So like, giving yourself yeah. that space, that grace, things are already being planted. And yeah. And that's how I felt over like the last, I don't know, year or so, like that my business has gone down because I've, you know, been playing with like, I reduced my prices because I wanted to like promote being accessible. And so I just reduced my prices without taking into account that like, I still had expenses and how was I going to then cover my expenses by basically just taking my income and slashing it in half. You know, and so that then started this pressure of like, okay, well then how do we launch all these other things to try to like supplement the income because you're not making as much and just all this pressure, like I just feel such a relief now being like, okay, we can just let that go for a while, you know, and yeah, I know that's not realistic for a lot of people, but, you know, in the ways that you can just like letting go of like yeah, just pressure to do things just to, you know, with an agenda to achieve a certain outcome. I know for myself, like letting go of that has really helped me just to like show up when it feels authentic. Yeah, same, same here. I feel like businesses, our own businesses is such a vessel for transformation. Like it has taken me to the depths of like, oh my gosh, I feel so vulnerable, exposed. Oh, somebody likes me, recognition. Oh, let's make money. Oh my gosh, am I a machine now? Do I need to show? Like it's all those things. It amplifies our conditioning like in a lot of areas, but it's like, okay, <laughs> if I want to be healthy, how can I let this be an expansion of me? And I also feel like for me, it's been a place of privilege because to be able to do that, it's knowing that I'm not going to lose my place if I don't make money, yeah. but it's also be like, okay, you're going to take a part-time job. What do you need? And a lot of times I'm like, I will take that gamble because it feels more truthful than whatever other version of certainty others want me to buy into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I still feel that pressure from my parents of like, oh, gosh. get a job, figure it out. Like, 
you know, I'm 38 years old and, you know, I'm, I'm single, never married, no kids. And that's totally like not the path that I was given as a child. Like it was like, you get married as soon as possible, have as many kids. That's like your sole purpose as a woman. So like, there's still, you know, a lot of conditioning. I feel like, especially ancestral um, wounds around like, the fact that I'm not living a traditional role as a woman, you know, oh. especially coming from that. And um, just this, uh, actually it was last year, just this past year, I came out to my parents as bi. And I've known that like most of my life, but repressed it because of so much conditioning. And so now I feel like it's really... I think the the true work for me is like learning to follow my own path, be myself, honor my values, even if that goes against my family values. You know, I, I have a lot of tribal energy in my chart. I was just so there's like say this, that. like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, fear around being like rejected from the tribe and like not being loved and accepted and undefined G being like, uh, let me be lovable. I'll be who I need to be for you to be lovable. And like learning that actually that's not the type of love that I want. That's not the type of relationships that I want. Like I want to be in community and relationships with people who allow me to be myself mm -hmm. and like putting and prioritizing that I feel like has been a lot of like the true work of as like, okay, I have this need to be in connection, be in community with others. And I have this tendency to prioritize that above my individuality. So how do I learn to like balance those to still be my authentic self and then allow that to attract the right people, the right communities, the right relationships? Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. I feel like something about relationships and especially parents are so activating and spaces to learn from because my, oh my parents, God, totally. they're same condition. And they're like, you're, you know, you're at a certain age, you're not going to have to, you're, and the way they say it, and part of me, like, I'll say it's a little bit ignorant, but their beliefs is like the older I am, the children are not going to come out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they keep telling me that they're like, the more you wait, I'm like, well, I've never, yes, I want to start a family, but I don't want to start because you're telling me to. And like, I need to honor my timing and whatever happens happens. But it's that pressure that comes from love and concern because that's the only certainty they know. So I, I realized every time I go there, I'm like, I'm gonna fight you. <laughs> and then it's like, I can let them say the things I know it comes from worry, but also needing to regulate myself because I amplify yeah. so much their, my mom's emotional solar plexus. I don't have her accurate chart, but it's like, she's very emotional. And it's like, oh, oh, like, you know, that's yeah. the feeling I get from phone calls and being like, okay, I'm not supposed to move from this energy and not taking it as mine. And that's, it's always going to be a lifelong lesson for me, at least being like, okay, this is what I feel. I don't have to make the truth about it. And then like, okay, can I release <laughs> right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so funny. My mom has a defined emotional solar plexus too. And yeah, being like, okay, like when I'm in her presence, I'm like, okay, let me just like get by myself to process this because I can definitely pick up on all of that. And, um, and it's been really helpful also understanding their designs to see and be like, okay, they're just coming from their conditioning from like, you know, almost everybody in my family has an undefined G center. And I can see that shadow of like, you know, how they took religion, took the church as like their identity, their direction, their path. And so then me rejecting that, it's like, what? Like, how, how dare you? Like, that's, that's what gives us identity and direction. And then like clinging to that. And so I can see how that feels, you know, challenging from that for them and how they don't understand it. And it's learning to like love myself and be like, all I need is the love for myself. And knowing that like, you know, I, I think too, I, I've learned like my parents love me even as much as like, sometimes I think um, it's conditional. It's like, it's, it's learning that like, that doesn't have to be 
the only love that I'm like prioritizing, that it's really about like learning to belong to myself first and foremost. Um, Cause again, I think I've, I've searched for love belonging my whole life without really finding that in myself first. Thank you for sharing that wisdom, belonging to ourselves. Yeah. It's a journey that I've been to and being so easily conditioned with the solar plexus and this identity, it's like, who do we have to be to be loved? And I was a perfect perfectionist girl that would get all the grades that was quiet and never talked back and didn't, I felt a lot. That's what they used to tell me. You feel too much. And I had to like tone my emotions. And I just had a conversation with my dad a few days ago and a family member was not doing well. And I'm asking to check in on him. And he's like, how do you know? I'm like, what do you mean? How do I know? Because they spent their entire lives trying to bury things under the rug and like, don't talk about it. It's not like you can solve anything. So like, you know, I'm like, no, I found out from another cousin, like, how are you doing? And I was like, starting to cry and sob in the past. I would be so embarrassed. I'm like, he's the one who's feeling so much and I'm crying. And I was like, no, actually, fuck that. He doesn't have the emotional maturity to hold my emotions. Doesn't mean I'm wrong. Doesn't mean I should shrink for him. So you, you reminded me that like, it's important to, yes, you know, heal those things that we can, but also the most important is like, how can we be honoring ourselves? Yeah. I mean, that, ultimately that's the only thing we can depend on. I mean, you know, it's, I, I want to believe in the best in people. I feel like I always try to see the best in people, but I also recognize that like, ultimately we're the only ones that we can depend on. And so if I, I'm constantly looking to other people to give me what I'm not giving myself. I'm going to always end up disappointed, you know, and, and I don't really think it's fair for us to enter into relationships expecting to get something from someone, you know, and that's been a huge thing for me to heal, you know, is because I did that for so long, like going into relationships, expecting somebody to give me something, whether it's security or love or validation or whatever because I wasn't giving that to myself, you know? And so now it's really been this process of like, how do I give all of that to myself so that I can enter into these relationships, not expecting anything or needing anything from anybody, but just truly being in it for the love of the person, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. I can see that rippling also in your business as it transforms itself, like filling your own cup not from a place of greed or like, you know, yeah. any of that from a place of love. And how would the world be when we are able to create from those spaces? That's something I'm contemplating. How do I create not from urgency, not from pressure, but from pleasure? How can I create because I have the spaciousness? So exploring that, still exploring that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we could solve a lot of things if people truly loved themselves, because I think so much stems out of us not loving ourselves. And I think that's another thing that human design can teach us. You know, it's one tool to like teach us how to love ourselves unconditionally. Oh yeah. You meant to that. <laughs> oh gosh, Randy, I can talk with you for hours. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a part two later in the year to hear about your transition if you're open. Oh to yeah. That. <laughs> But where, what are you up to now? Like, what, where can people find you? You have so many amazing tools and lectures and you've created so many things. Tell us more about it. <laughs> yeah. So you can go to my website, randylee.net. All of my stuff you can find on my website, how to work with me, my different courses. Uh, I offer like personalized variable reports. I have like a transit guide if you're interested in following the transits lots of resources. If you're into human design and the gene keys, I still do readings. So I'll still be doing that even in this transition. So yeah, go to my website where I hang out the most is probably Instagram, but that might change. So I think my website is my best place. And on there, you'll also find a link to my podcast. So I host a podcast called the uplifting podcast. And this season I've shifted it to be a seasonal podcast. That's another uh, change that I've done to really try to like embody more of the cyclical nature is like, you know, like we were talking about, we're not always designed to just be going and producing. And I did a podcast where I had a new episode every week 
for I think like four years, I oh, produced an episode every years. week. Yeah. I did it for yeah. one year. I was like, I can't, I can't. And then yeah. I stopped like for crazy. two years. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. And so I, I finally was like, I can't keep doing this and made the decision to go seasonal. So we, I just launched a new season where we're focusing on talking about right angle incarnation crosses. And the next season in the fall, we're going to talk about left angle incarnation crosses. So it's an area that I feel like there's not a lot of exploration around and like, especially diving into connecting the nuances in somebody's design to their incarnation cross. Cause a lot of times when you get an explanation about an incarnation cross, it's like a blurb that's very generalized yeah. and it just is basically summarizing the four gates in the incarnation cross, but not taking into account your profile, your type, your variable yeah. configuration, your definition. And so it's been really cool to have these conversations and talk to people about their incarnation cross, but to see how it comes through uniquely in like the the holistic view of their chart, like in taking into account all of these different areas, not just looking at the four placements. So that's been really fun. And uh, yeah, so that's where you can find me. Oh, thank you for that. I know where people are going right after that. They're going to your podcast. <laughs> so many of them just like, they want to hear more because yeah, there's not a lot, there's a lot of information, but at the same time, not a lot of information that is so focused on the specifics of it. So here's to embracing that change that whatever is coming. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much, Jess. It's been such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. If you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect women, check out the Align and Embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com. You'll also find resources on mindset, human design, and archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.